I was reading in the uh, paper just this morning about a young West Australian couple who uh, won $1.25 million in lotto on the weekend. Uh, their fourth time that they'd been doing lotto ever. And uh, they've bought a few toys, but they're going to uh, use the rest to be able to fund uh, some study that he wants to do, uh, the young man wants to do, and to quit his job. And uh, it seems like in a country like Australia, where we are fabulously wealthy, when you do get extra money, it just funds an increasingly uh, uh, the lifestyle that you want. And uh, we live in a place of great wealth. Now, we're not the only country at the time that has uh, had to grapple with the issue of wealth from a wealthy perspective. Uh, what do the wealthy think about wealth? That's one of the questions that is raised by the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Uh, traditionally, it's been understood that much of the wisdom literature, from uh, Job through to uh, Ecclesiastes and Songs of Songs, Psalms, Proverbs, uh, that was all uh, written at a time when Israel was doing fairly well as a nation. And the questions raised by the wisdom literature are, are often uh, questions about uh, how do we deal with wealth, because we've got it, or is there a correlation between wealth and God's blessing on your life for obedience? And really, much of that springs out of the fact that the blessings that were promised in Deuteronomy to those who obeyed uh, seem to be flowing into people's lives who weren't necessarily living the way that the uh, covenant relationship with God would say. Uh, so Ecclesiastes, for example, uh, deals with the whole question of um, why do some foolish people have money? Uh, how come some good people have lots of stuff but die early and leave it to someone who doesn't know their right hand from their left? These are uh, interesting questions that are asked. And in the, uh, in the story of Job, Job, allows, uh, or Job allow, is allowed by God to, to lose everything. Uh, Satan comes along and uh, he really takes Job to the cleaners and removes all of his wealth and all of his possessions down to his family members. Now it's interesting what Job says when things have gone completely uh, haywire. He says this in uh, chapter 1 verse uh, 21. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a fairly good uh, summary of uh, the wisdom literature's understanding of, uh, of money, that we didn't bring anything in, we're not bringing anything out, uh, God gives, he takes away, uh, we should honour him. Uh, in the story, however, uh, the fly in the ointment isn't so much Satan as it is Job's friends, who, when he's lost everything, come to him to comfort him, but what odd comfort they give. They basically impugn his righteousness and say, uh, God's a quid pro quo God. Uh, you put good in, you get good out. That's the way it's supposed to work. And that paradigm was probably in Israel at the time uh, of, this, of the writing of the wisdom literature that do good, good comes out. And Job especially breaks the nexus between being faithful to God and having spiritual or having material blessing. And that quid pro quo relationship had soured in Israel too, so that people wouldn't even think about necessarily uh, their relationship with God uh, if they were doing okay. Not that they wouldn't think about it, they, but they would assume that they're doing okay because financially they're doing okay. And it's interesting that uh, Job defends his own righteousness before God and asks God for an explanation, and God doesn't give him one. God just says, where were you when I put the whole place together? And Job has to realise that he is but a human. And at the end of the book, he really realises that he's got nothing to say before God. Now, when you come to the Psalms, uh, there's a situation where you find that many, in the, many of the Psalms are written about people who are, have been poor and, then are, and, and have become wealthy. So David writes some of the Psalms from a perspective of where he's not doing so well. Other Psalms he would have written when he was king. Uh, in that book, however, the thing that it, we come across is that God loves those who are poor in spirit. Uh, there's a certain element in the Psalms that God is with the righteous man and there are many wicked who are doing well who are scoffing the righteous man. So that starts to break the link between uh, doing uh, well financially and, and spiritual success. 
However, when you come to the book of Proverbs, it definitely could be misunderstood as being completely quid pro quo, that the observations in Proverbs, which uh, we look around at and we see people work hard and they do well. People slack off, they don't do well. The righteous are doing well, uh, the sinners are going to fall by the wayside. Often that's a caricature of uh, Proverbs because it's a little bit more complex than that, but there's certainly a sense that the Proverbs, which are observations about life, uh, give the general impression that if you work hard, you will do well, and if you don't, you won't. Now, that's obviously true to a certain level, but the, the real tension question is, what about those who are working hard or have been godly and have fallen in a heap? Those are questions that Proverbs itself, as wisdom literature, uh, doesn't really deal with as much. However, in a very interesting uh, book um, by Ben Witherington or called Jesus and Money, he offers Ecclesiastes as the counter-wisdom to the wisdom of Proverbs. And he says that counter-wisdom uh, says that despite all the things that are going on that would seem to give you wealth, how come it seems that that's not what's happening? It's, Ecclesiastes is the dark side of life and of death. Prosperity is seen as a desirable thing, but at the same time as being desirable, it's fleeting, it's precarious, it's attainable, but not always capable. And worse still, you could do really, really well, and uh, your children could end up being fools and inheriting your money. Now, you don't have to go far in our own culture to see that Gina Reinhardt is concerned that her own children are going to inherit a lot of money from her and uh, they're not actually up to looking after it in the way that she has. So you can see the issue there. So the traditional order of Proverbs breaks down in Ecclesiastes. It's as if there's a cold wind of change over the culture where we see the ignorant and foolish prospering and those who work hard on Struggle Street. And you can see that in our day as well too, can't you? Where people work hard and are finding that they're just keeping their noses above water when some airhead goes on on a reality TV show and makes a million dollars and uh, is set up for life as a celebrity. It would seem that not everything is fair when it comes to how money works out, that it isn't all quid pro quo. That's really the message of the wisdom literature as it moves. It starts with um, observations about life, that if you work hard you make money and you can do well, but it does change as it gets through it, that there are some instances where that just doesn't seem to work. What is lacking from the wisdom literature is a really clear picture of the afterlife. Uh, there are hints of it, but one thing that we're pushing towards as we move through a biblical theology of money and possessions is, what about the age to come? When we get to the New Testament, we're going to see how much that flowers into a full reality in, uh, in people's minds. But what about the age to come enables you to cope with the lack of wealth or the lack of blessing in this age? That's a key question that we're going to look at in the future as well.